So in the introduction video, we talked about how DNA is one of the most important molecules of life and it's at the core of all biology research that people are doing nowadays because DNA is the molecule that serves as the instructions to build all the proteins which are your phenotype. And so the genotype is definitely very important to learn about. And just to put a perspective on how much DNA we're talking about here, look at this. DNA by the numbers. Each cell has about two meters worth of DNA. So if you were to get all the DNA in the cell and stretch it thin from cover to cover, you would, you would get about two meters, which is about at the height of a tall human. Now, if you get the fact that we have 75 trillion cells in our body, that's enough DNA to go from the Earth to the sun about 400 times. Now, if you consider that the distance between the Earth and the sun is 150 billion meters, that is amazing. Now, of course, that would be very, very thin because the DNA molecule is only about two nanometers across, so this would be, be almost invisible. But the fact of the matter is, the length of the DNA code would be enough to, to cover two meters worth of, of information per cell. And all the cells in your body pretty much have the same DNA, but if you were to get all of the DNA and stretch it thin, you go to the sun and back and back and back and back and back and back 200 times or 400 total trips. And that's incredible. Now, if you consider all the DNA that all the humans have and all the life on Earth has, imagine how much DNA, how much genetic information is out there. But at first, we didn't know that DNA was the key. Like we talked about, people were dubious uh, whether or not proteins or DNA were the more, most important molecule of life since proteins is what we're made of. Some people thought that it was the protein that we inherited from our parents, not the DNA. And so to prove this, a series of studies were done over several, several, many years in order for us to finally achieve the point that we understood that DNA is the molecule of life. It all started with Frederick Griffith. And what Frederick Griffith did is that he got a mouse and if this mouse was injected with the strain of bacteria that's called the rough strain or the R strain, and it's rough because of the way the surface of the bacteria looked, nothing would happen to the mouse. The mouse was pretty much immune to that bacteria and would beat it. However, if this bacteria was the S strain or smooth strain bacteria, it's what we call a virulent bacteria. Now, virulent bacteria are bacteria that would kill you. They're deadly. And in this case, the, the mouse dies. Now, what he actually did is that he got the bacteria that was deadly and he heated up to kill it and then he tried to put those 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 dead bacteria inside the mouse and nothing happened then what he did is that he got the dead bacteria mixed it up with the with the with the, a rough strain bacteria and injected the mouse and the mouse died and then he was like what's going on here why is it that by itself the dead bacteria does not kill the mouse but if I put it along the good bacteria, it kills the mouse. Now, he eventually figured out that what was happening here is that pieces of the bad bacteria were being incorporated by the good bacteria. In other words, the good bacteria was taking something of the bad bacteria inside of those heat-killed bad bacteria. Some of the materials coming from that bad bacteria were being sent inside the good one and transforming it into bad and therefore transforming the the R strain which was no okay into a deadly strain and that suggested that there was it was possible to change one life form into another by changing something about the life form so Oswald Avery uh, Macklin McCarthy and Colin McLeod repeated this experiment but first they separated into the different parts of the cell and namely, he actually, what they did, they, they extracted the different materials from the cell, including the DNA. And when they finally extracted the DNA, and you see that being done here, by the way, we will be doing this in class. We'll be extracting the DNA of strawberries, and we'll look somewhat like this. You see this white, viscous material that's in the bottom of the jar there. He picked up that DNA and extracted that and put just that into the virulent, non-virulent strain of bacteria. And that was enough to turn the bacteria deadly. And so he figured it out that it was the DNA of the, of the S strain that was making the R strain become deadly. So he pretty much redid Griffith's experiment, but in a way that actually showed the DNA was the key for the transformation that Griffith was seeing. Then, uh, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, two biologists studying viruses, 
called bacteriophages, and these are viruses which attack bacteria and insert their own DNA inside the bacteria and change the bacteria by that process. They were studying that, and they were figuring out how is what exactly about the viruses is changing the bacteria. Now, they already knew at this point that the virus were basically made of two things. The virus had a capsule, right? And then it had these little lag-looking things that it used to connect to the bacteria, as you can see in the pictures on the bottom. And that this capsule and the lags were made of protein. And then inside, they had a DNA or RNA or genetic material of, a, of some sort. Now, they were interested in finding out whether the DNA or the protein was what was important to make the virus change. So in other words, is it DNA or is it protein that's more important? Now, at this point, Avery had already transformed bacteria just the way the Griffith had done by doing not just the whole pieces of the bacteria, but only the DNA, and showing that it was the DNA that was the key. But it wasn't until her she confirmed that to the bacteriophage study that everybody agreed that DNA was the key. Now, let's show you how he did it. First, now remember the proteins are made of certain kinds of element. Namely, they will have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, okay, and nitrogen, okay? Now, our DNA will also have the same elements. However, proteins are the only ones of the two that actually include, in addition to these things, they will also include sulfur. So proteins will also include sulfur. Now, in the case of DNA, DNA would include something else that proteins does not include. It will include phosphorus. Phosphorus. And so if you get and you tag that phosphorus with the, with the green dye, all right, and you tag the sulfur with the red dye, that means that the and then you make the virus replicates out of what using those tagged chemicals that all the parts which are protein of the virus will become red and all the parts which are DNA about the virus will become green as you see happening in the pictures there now if they were like if the protein is the key then when we look at the cell later on we will see that there will be a lot of red inside the cell and then that's what actually changed the cell because the red part of the virus or the, pro or the protein was what made inside. If there's a lot of phosphorus inside the cell coming from the virus, then they noticed there was the DNA that went inside the cell and it was the DNA that made the, the, the bacteria change because of the virus. So because DNA has phosphorus but proteins don't and because proteins have sulfur which DNA doesn't, they could use that to differentiate between the parts of the virus. Now, their studies indicated that none of the protein actually went inside the cell for the virus they were looking at, and that changes those. Some viruses actually do get inside the cell, including their protein layers, but in this case, the protein wasn't coming inside, but the DNA did, and that was enough to make the actual infection take place, the blending take place, and then finally, the cells would change because of that. And so... That way, Hershey and Chase identified that it was really the DNA that was the key on on molecule of life. Another scientist named Edwin Shargaff studied the chemical composition of the DNA molecule. And he discovered the DNA pairing rules. First, he discovered what the DNA was made of. He realized it was made of sugar, phosphate groups, and nitrogenous bases, which includes adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And he discovered that these molecules were made of different structures that that there was two purines, adenine and guanine, and two pyrimidines, thymine and cytosine, and the cytosine and thymine were single-ringed, and then adenine and guanine were double-ringed with nitrogenous bases. We'll talk about more about that in the next video. What's interesting about it is that he also discovered that the amount of adenine was always the same as the amount of thymine, and that the amount of guanine was always the same as the amount of cytosine. He comes up with the idea of base pairing rules, which is basically that the amounts of A will always be the same as T, and therefore they must be paired, and the amount of C is always the same amount of G, and therefore they, all, they always must be paired. And check it out. In corn, for example, you have about 26% or 27% A, and also 27% T. But if you look at the G, it's going to be 23% for both. So that's, that seems to indicate the base pairing rules is true. Let's look at E. coli, a bacteria, to totally different type of species. You have 25% on, on A, 25% on A, and you're going to have 24, 20, around 24% on T, so it's very similar. And then you have around 26% of both G and C, so you see the same pattern again. Look at yeast. Look at yeast. You have 17, 18% 17, for C and G, and then you have about 32% for A and T. See that? So you see that these two columns, that column 
and that column will have similar numbers. Well, and then these two columns will also have similar numbers. So he actually analyzed the percentage composition of A, G, C, and T of those four nitrogenous bases that make the DNA molecule across several different species, and he fall, found a pattern of, of the, how much of the DNA was composed of each of, each of these things, and then he found that across life, across life, there's always an equal ratio of A and T. Look at those numbers. Always a, about one one to one ratio of A and T, and always a one to one ratio of G to C. And that and although, and although the percentage of A, the percent of a G, the percent of a C, and percent of a T will change throughout life forms, the percentage of A is always equal to the percentage of T or very close, and the percent of a G is always equal to the percent of a C or very close. And that is what he discovered as he studied the chemical composition of the DNA molecule. Then a scientist named Maurice Wilkins invented a machine called the um, X-ray diffraction machine. And this machine was used to study the molecular structure of tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic things. And then over painstakingly, many years of painstakingly taking pictures and even getting cancer, ended up dying because of this, because of the radiation of the X-ray machine. Rosalind Franklin actually discovered, finally managed to take a picture of the DNA molecule several times and concluded beyond any reasonable doubt that the DNA was a helical molecule, as you can see in this picture here. And she actually never got the credit until after she died, uh, because Wilkins was more famous and kind of tried to take the credit. And nowadays, nobody gives him credit. All he did is invent the machine. She was the one that used it to actually uh, painstakingly take pictures and discover uh, that the DNA was, in fact, a helical shape. Finally, you have James Watson and Francis Crick, which were the first ones to put it all together and come up with the model of the DNA double helix structure of the molecule. They won the race for the Nobel Prize, and both won Nobel Prizes for being the first scientists to come up with a model that explains everything the DNA does. And we'll have a video about that and their discoveries and how they put it all together. Uh, I think it's going to be a couple of videos from this one. And so they were the first ones to develop the model of the DNA molecule as the double helix. And we'll talk about that on a, on a future video. The last one I have to tell you about is Matthew Madison and Franklin Stahl, two scientists that, that, that invented a procedure to explain how DNA was actually copied. And they discovered the idea of the semi-conservative model of DNA replication. And we'll also talk about that at the last video of this lecture series. So I'll, 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 I'll keep that for that time. So, you have Fred Griffith with transformation experiments. O Avery redoes it and discovers that the DNA is the key. Hershey and Chase do, do something similar with bacteriophages and determine that the protein is not as important as DNA is to make transformation happen. Shagraff studies the chemical composition, uh, including the base pairing rules. Morris Wilkins develops a machine which Watson Franklin uses to discover that the DNA is a helical molecule. And then Watson and Crick put all together to make a model that is of the DNA molecule and then Meselson and Stahl discover how it's replicated. Now, we're, in the next video, we're going to talk about how all of this actually is and what the structure of the DNA molecule actually looks like. See you guys then.